we talk financial inclusion and we try to measure it by the bank versus unbanked uh, percentage of the population, I believe uh, this concept itself is outdated because if you see in Africa, uh, mobile money was born in, in Kenya. And I just read an article yesterday that Mshwari, which is uh, like a, a system that allows people to make savings using mobile money, uh, hits last year half trillion shillings. So, I mean, I know that there are still a lot to be done and Africa is still behind in many aspects when it comes to financial inclusion. But I believe there are alternatives. There's a revolution which is happening in the fintech, in mobile money, in other new innovative ways, uh, you know, that, that creates a new kind of ecosystem when it comes to, to payments. And although um, there are still, I mean, there are like regulations that needs to be used to really facilitate the development of that sector. But I believe Africa is on the right track, you know, so for me, it's very difficult to, you know, use statistics about like bank versus unbank to really uh, quantify um, like financial inclusion. If you look at the way it has been happening, instead of uh, trying to, you know, open bank account to all of those people, I believe what it needs to happen is what is already happening is allowing African people to use alternative technologies such as mobile money to start you know, benefiting from other type of services, such as loans, such as, um, you know, being able to make payments, being able to transact online. So ultimately, the definition of financial inclusion is being able to access those type of services. I need a loan to finance my business, so I'm able to get it through the, the channel that I'm using, which can be mobile money, which can be a bank account and so on. So, I mean, of course, there are, I mean, there are uh, works to be done. The regulation needs to, to be looked at to facilitate um, the development of, of these new alternate, al al I mean, I would say alternate kind of payment systems. And also, one thing I believe which is important is they are quite fragmented. So interoperability is something I believe which is very important, where government needs to really play a role in bringing together those fragmented kind of fintechs and fintech solutions that can really uh, make sure that people can take full advantage of the development of this financial ecosystem in general. You know, those payment systems such as mobile money started uh, in a way allowing, you know, people to transfer value, stored value with money from one individual to the other, to someone living in the remote. But now they are being used for many uh, different purposes today. You know, you can go, you buy, you using mobile money, you can make transfer and so on. So now what I've been seeing in many countries is uh, there are a few aggregators. They obtain license from the government in order to really aggregate and allow cross kind of platforms payment, you know. But this is where I believe uh, many countries are taking the right steps in the right direction by stepping in as central bank, the same way they did for traditional banks, to put in place interoperability platform, such as the one that we have developed internally at Global Voice Group, which allows to bring all the fragmented um, payment system. When mobile money started, and uh, it started with providing basic services, so now, it kept evolving, new order services are being added. And now we are reaching this stage where, of course, we are realizing that um, those systems can be operating in silos. And, and that's why, I mean, there are many initiatives in many countries where government and uh, private sectors are really working to really uh, uh, provide interoperability. So in our case, for example, we just launched recently a platform called Transfin, is a, a platform that assist from a government standpoint to provide interoperability at a country level. And it also takes into account many like needs and requirements government might need when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to interoperability. Being able as a government to make payments regardless of the channel, banks, mobile money to like uh, um, to the to the public sector employees, being able to pay like social programs and stuff like that. So those, those, are, those are areas where we shouldn't look at it. why do we need interoperability. It's also because 
we believe it can bring a lot of value to all the stakeholders and participants in the whole ecosystem. I wouldn't say that Africa, I mean, doesn't have interoperability. I believe, you know, there have been for the past few years, a very fast development in the fintech, in uh, mobile money, in more sophisticated transactions happening on top of mobile money. And now this natural evolution requires uh, like more integration, require like for those different, you know, payment solutions can speak with each other, you know. So that's, I mean, we are at this stage and governments, uh, agent, government agencies such as central banks, and you have private sectors. Now, I mean, it's a, it's a movement that have already started. So how can we create like a framework where those different systems can speak with each other? Because this way it can benefit all, you know, the citizens, the population really participating uh, in, uh, in this whole uh, digital economy. Central bank is already involved. As a central bank, they set the rules or anything related to uh, monetary policy. They have in place uh, rules and guidelines to monitor compliance and um, to fight money laundries and to control CTF, KYC. They've already involved. Now, what I believe has to happen is uh, further involvement to really facilitate like more integration between different fragmented, different fragment, fragmented ecosystem, you know, where, for example, uh, the same way they are doing the settlement for all the banks and, 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 and between like transactions and stuff like that, they need also to consider mobile money as really another part of the whole payment system that needs to be integrated within the same framework and looking, looking at them as innovative solutions and put in place the right policies and to really accommodate those new innovative solutions. Uh, as I say, Central Bank is already involved and now it's a matter of, you know, setting the right rules and policies to create that integration, to create that, to make sure to bring every, everyone on board. And I think it will happen seamlessly, you know, so I, I, I don't see it as a problem. I mean, it's the opposite. I see it's a, it's a great opportunity really for, I mean, I, I believe Wanda also set the example when it comes to the use of ICT for, you know, good governance. And I think it's, it's just set in the right direction. You, you are a client of a small company, you are able to transact and to uh, access, um, you know, um, uh, you know, inf like products from the other different companies. So, I believe it can even help the small ones because if you have the, the main company providing like uh, the usual service and stuff like that, so the small player coming in, if he, do, if he cannot have access to, you know, almost the whole population, which uh, like, a, like a gateway can provide, I think it can slow down even its development. So I believe and then there are also rules where the government can say, listen, no, you need to allow this innovative solution to be connected, you as the biggest player in the market, to your, to your platform. This way, they can, you can really allow those kind of development to really be successful. So I think it can bring benefits to the small players. I believe, you know, um, f reaching financial inclusion or taking steps to reach financial inclusion and can solve a lot of problems, not all the problems, okay? So I believe, yes, of course, and by, having, by big, having big part of the economy migrating to the digital economy uh, where all transactions happen online, the authorities, central banks especially, and the financial intelligence unit has more capabilities to really oversee and monitor compliance and fight more effectively against money laundry. By the way, these are the solutions that we have as the Bulbers Group. We have uh, provided to many uh, central banks and telecom regulators like in Tanzania, in Rwanda, in Uganda, in Ghana, in Congo, Brazzaville, they are using that platform that we, we provide. But when it comes to, uh, you know, certain kind of flows, of course, there are other regulations that need to be in place. And of course, having the right tool to monitor the compliance, I think it will be very useful. Uh, we consider ourselves to be pioneer in reg tech in Africa. Uh, reg tech regulatory technology. So uh, we've been working in many countries or working in the continent for the past 20 years. And uh, we started by 
providing solutions to the newly created telecom regulators. Um, like when the market uh, become liberalized with having the new MNOs coming in. So the, the telecom regulators needed tools to really monitor compliance on what is happening in terms of like uh, market pricing, quality of service and so on. So this is how we started. But over the years, we kept developing new solutions for the telecom regulators so they can keep up with the development of the telecom sector in general. And as you know, the telecom sector represents the backbone of the digital economy on which many other services have been deployed, such as mobile money. So, uh, so today, I can tell you, we have developed solutions. Anything that a telecom regulator needs today, we as GVG, when it comes to use ICT to really help them, we have so quality of service, starting you know, traffic monitoring, revenue assurance monitoring, we have like different solutions uh, in that aspect. So what we have also done is develop solutions such as mobile money monitoring, uh, adding the AML um, capabilities for them to monitor the AML monitoring, like this compliance monitoring. So we have developed a uh, solution in that sense. We're also working now in developing uh, solutions related to identities because we believe, I mean, this is a, a cornerstone of really the to allow the development and financial inclusion, people need to be identified in many countries. Uh, people are talking about digital ID, identity, but even the simple ID is not in, is not in place. Okay, so we are busy uh, really in our research and development unit, developing solutions that goes into how, uh, like even the basic ID can be translated into, into digital ID. And one of the last solutions we just launched is this, uh, interoperability solution, Transfin, because we saw that governments really, uh, they are promoting the use of uh, new, like innovative solutions such as mobile, mo mobile money, kind of um, mobile payments and so on, but they don't necessarily use it. So we said, okay, why, why don't we come and just help bring together a fragmented ecosystem and at the same time provide different applications to governments such as payroll management where the government can pay um, people directly on mobile money or the government. So there's no need to give a, che a check that you go and get cash. So that will even streamline the whole process of payroll, like social program, like pension. So we put a comprehensive platform based on what we understood to be a big part of the problem of really digitizing the whole uh, like um, payment system or government as one of the player is lagging, is, is kind of behind when it comes to the use of this kind of payment system. That's how we came up with that new platform. Yeah. We, our solution has been deployed in more than 15 African countries. 15, and today I can tell you we, we are finalizing the implementation in, in, in countries like Zimbabwe, and uh, we, we work like in Central Africa, in uh, West Africa, in many countries like Ghana, Senegal. And it's just like whenever we speak with um, decision makers and because one of the key component of our solution is about big data. It's about collect data in order to dig in them and monitor compliance. Okay, so it's a data-driven kind of policy. Because, because one of the issues we, we saw in the past is, I mean, still in many countries, government relies on, okay, they, sort, they set, they define a new policy, new regulation. So they are waiting like, to see the impact of that. But having ICT tools such as the one we provide, they are able to, in real time, collect all the necessary information to see the how efficient is that new policy or, or new regulation? So that also, I believe, yeah, the market is, is ready. I think there, there are a lot of demands and, and then well, governments are seeing that uh, they can make use of technology as a the good allies, you know, in order to achieve their goals as regulatory bodies. There, big data is being used I mean, uh, companies, many companies in Africa already, like the mobile network operators are sitting on a lot of data that they are crunching. And they are, at, if you look at, there are different programs in different universities in Africa, even in, here in Rwanda, and that are 
you know, teaching about like the, the use of big data. You know, big data you have the infrastructure component, and you also you have like different level of the, the the data can be used. You know, it's it's more than having a big volume of data. It's also about like how you can make them become like actionable intelligence. And this is something that when I say the um, I mean, it's, it's happening in Africa because you, you, we exclusively work in Africa and we've been working with many countries where we provide our solutions that are really based on the use of big data. We are a Pan-African company and um, yes, and we are very proud of our identity and uh, we bring knowledge from all over the world, you know. So we have development center in Spain. We worked, uh, we used to have part of our research and development base in Estonia because we believe Estonia, they had a very good, um, uh, they developed a very good solution when it comes to good governance. So we bring uh, knowledge from all over the world, but we have this Pan-African identity because this is where we started as a company and this is where we develop solutions that take into account the, the reality of the African market. What we've seen with the development of FinTech, there are new players coming into the market. You know, we have, I mean, I don't want to name, but you can have now today a uh, remittance from London that lends directly to your mobile money account here. So that is, but the problem is those are the same players trying to offer, I mean, these kind of services by partnering with the mobile, mobile network operator. So, but I believe by creating the right environment and by providing like uh, the right type of licenses to like innovators here, like to startups within Africa. There are many, I've seen it, I've, I've seen this is, the, is it, it's happening already and uh, I see like the way it's happening in Kenya. Uh, there's this company which as a, we invest in, Pesa Kit, empowering the agents to really, you know, verify KYC and so, so I believe there are a lot of things that are happening that, and if, with the right regulations, and you can see many different uh, players emerge and start providing service at lower, low, low, lower price. The other factor also that I believe that will be very useful or very beneficial is the use of the blockchain technology. And by investing in education, and there have been a lot of progress in that, by investing in infrastructure and technologies, there have been a lot of like investment in that sense. By defining the clear vision, I think the leaders also, they are different forums there are, where they discuss about how to really define the vision like for Africa and for African countries. I believe we are in the right direction to, to really embark and be successful in this for African revolution. So if you look at, for example, in the past, the players used to be only uh, startups from, from the US, from Europe that could make it worldwide. But we've seen a few startups from Africa, from Nigeria, from Kenya, from South Africa that are getting global scale because it's about uh, understanding technologies, about like uh, creating something that can reach the critical mass, that can solve both of the population. Um, the guy who sits in his basement in Boston is not smarter than our, you know, young guy who went to college and was sitting in his basement in, in, in Kigali. So now I think by this, this new wave of development and, and, and in ICT in general, I think is, is leveling the, the playing uh, field, you know, to give us an opportunity to really uh, be successful in that of industrial revolution. If you look at the, the funding in the startup ecosystem in Africa has been increasing very fast. You know, there have been a lot of funding and funds injection in many, many uh, like startups hubs in like in Nigeria, in Kenya, in South Africa. And I believe there are People, I mean, the young guys that has an idea, I mean, of course, should start like working on it and to reach a level where he can start pitching at different level. Today, you can be in Kigali and you are pitching to VCs uh, in LA. So if you have the right solutions and you meet 
you have the right uh, partners that can really help you in that sense. But I believe also the private sector needs to also play a role, you know, by investing in in in, in those young startups because we at Global Voice Group, this is like we set we set up a fund uh, a couple of years ago, where instead of developing or trying to have in-house research and development, but to start and try to understand startups that has that have synergies with the kind of business we are in, and we invest in them, we help them accelerate their growth, and they're part of our group. Interesting, and you know, I, I read a lot, so I think it's uh, not necessarily about technology, so I read about history, about uh, try to really uh, keep myself busy on learning new stuff, so I'm a very curious person. And also try to, you know, have some kind of like visit new locations. For example, I live in Madrid in Spain, but whenever I visit a country like Wanda, I just don't come and have meetings and then leave. So I try to go and visit the countryside to discover these new cultures. I'm very, uh, yeah, you know, those, those kind of things I, I really like and enjoy. And also, of course, try to create time to have like to, to you know, to, exercise and sports and stuff like that so it's a it's a and it's kind of a, I would say a mix of different kind of activities you know yeah not necessarily related to technologies I'm originally from Haiti by the way okay so <laughs> so, so I, I was really fortunate to uh, like see how Africa the landscape when it comes to ICD is changing I remember my first trip to Africa I uh, was to Gambia and back then I saw that how a whole country they were they had an, an in, like an antenna of 10 megabytes to provide internet for the whole country you know so today on your smartphone you have more than 30 megabytes for you to um, so I've seen and I, I've I had the, the chance and privilege to visit more than 30 or to, to spend more than one a week, more than once in more than 30 African countries. So since then, um, I really, I, I see how technology has really helped in, in changing lives. And this is something that I think there's still a lot to be done. And I'm very, you know, passionate about that. And, and I don't see technology as the, like the end game and the, the objective, the, I see it as a mean to really uh, improve uh, socioeconomic life and then I'm very very happy to be part of that journey and that believe that uh, every time I wake up I say okay the technology that I mean I'm advising the government to use can really make a difference in life of people. There are like a couple of investments made in a few startups from Ni Nigeria recently. Those guys can become quite big. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> no it's definitely I think uh, yeah of course um, I mean there are different you can become a big ICT company, but not doing exactly what Facebook does, you know. So there are many, maybe you can become a huge IT company that really solves a lot of uh, issues faced in Africa by African people. I know a few of them, they work for Microsoft, for Google, for a while. And then after they learn a lot and they go and create their own company. And because they believe now, they understand how they can apply this technology to solve real problems that, is, that are closer to them. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I've been coming to Wanda since 2012 when we entered into an agreement with Rura, yeah. the telecom regulator, to provide our uh, telecom monitoring platform. Mm -hmm. And since then, Rura has been a key partner for us. And Wanda, in general, is like um, one of the countries that you know I'm very excited to uh, to work with because they are very forward-looking in terms of creating the right environment in the telecom sector in the financial sector for the development of the for the use of ICT to really foster the development of of the whole like uh, ecosystem um, the, since the telecom sector is so uh, transversal it's you know it touches different kind of organizations so the solution we provide to Aurora uh, is being used by other government agencies such as central bank for example to monitor mobile money compliance and also it's being used by revenue authority to look at uh, revenue assurance component of the telecom telecom sector. So 
Rurai's domain, domain I, I don't like to say client, but domain partner. And then from there, I mean, we, we, we really, exactly, definitely.